This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories. Empty check-in desks as South Africa Airways cancels all its weekend flights. Workers are on strike over potential job losses. The management doesn't come and engage to us. We are, we are will strike un, unlimited. A thawing of relations, Kenya and Somalia take a step towards a closer relationship despite their ongoing maritime border dispute. We'll have all the details. Life in prison for the rape and murder of a 19-year-old South African student, which sparked protests highlighting the issue of violence against women. Also in the program, the footballers signing up and saving children. We find out how football club AS Roma is using its digital reach to help bring missing children home. The first time we found out that a missing child who'd featured in one of our videos had been found was, was one of the best feelings I've ever had. And in sports, more qualifying matches today for the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. South Africa Airways staff have made good their threat and gone on strike. After the airline failed to reach an agreement with unions on Thursday, they are demanding higher pay and no job cuts. Around 3,000 of the 5,000 staff are thought to be on strike and it's costing the airline over $3.3 million a day. The BBC's Nomsa Maseko was at Oliver Tambo Airport. Check-in counters deserted. More than a hundred flights cancelled. Thousands of South African Airways employees are on strike over wages and job cuts. The impact of the strike can certainly be felt here. South African Airways is already under severe financial strain. The company is running at a loss and has not turned a profit since 2011. This indefinite strike action has the potential to put this airline out of business. Workers are demanding an 8% pay hike, but the cash-strapped airline says it can only afford just over 5%. The airline, which is without a permanent CEO, said the strike by the unions will cost it over 3 million US dollars a day, and that the strike action could threaten its survival. For every day we have a total cancellation of flights, we're speaking about a lost revenue in the amount of 52 million rand per day. If we run, if we continue in that trajectory, the airline faces a risk of shutting down. Unions representing thousands of striking workers who gathered outside the airport rejected the airline's wage offer. And they also want to secure jobs for nearly a thousand workers who are facing retrenchments. Here you have an airline that's about to collapse because of corruption. Where is the intervention from government? Why is it in any other private corporation, if you had a board that brought an entity to the brink of collapse twice, that board would have been fired. And yet the board of SAA continues to keep its jobs, the executive management, they continue to earn generous perks and generous salaries. There's no consequence management. It's up to us as members of the working class to force this type of change. South African Airways is among a number of government-owned companies that are battling tough financial conditions after years of mismanagement and allegations of widespread corruption. The airline is technically insolvent and cannot afford a prolonged strike. But for as long as management is at loggerheads with the unions, the future of the national carrier looks bleak. Nomsa Masego, BBC News, Johannesburg. Well, let's stay in South Africa because a former post office worker in the country has been sentenced to three lifetimes for the rape and murder of a University of Cape Town student. 19-year-old Uyinene's violent death sparked protests in Johannesburg, as the BBC's Pumza Pihlani reports. There were cheers and applause inside the Western Cape High Court while the sentence of Leander Borta was being handed down. The family were in the courtroom and had been eagerly awaiting the outcome of a court case that many South Africans had been watching closely. It's not so much that a young person was murdered that made this case resonate with so many people. It was that it happened in a public space in a post office doing something as mundane as collecting a parcel. 
This is what happened to 19-year-old Uyenene Mkhwetiana back in August when she visited a post office in Cape Town to collect a parcel. We now know that Leander Borta, who has been found guilty of her murder and rape, lured her into a private space within the post office where he proceeded to make sexual advances at her and then proceeded to attack her. It's a case that has shone a spotlight on quite how dangerous this country can be for South Africa's women. What has the sentence taught us, though? It happened at a time where the country is really looking within itself and trying to find ways of addressing the high levels of violence. So many are hoping that the sentences that were passed against Luanda Borta will go some way in showing that the country the country's judicial system is determined to turn things around. The protests that were experienced throughout the country shortly after Uyenene's murder were a clear message, not just to the justice system, but also to the government, that South Africa's women want to feel safe in this country and that they feel that not enough is being done to make sure that their safety is guaranteed. And for some, this sentence will go a long way in trying to undo the harsh damage that has been done over the years. Pumza Fitlani, BBC News, Johannesburg. Well, let's now take a quick look at other stories making headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. The former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, who was fired by President Trump, has told the impeachment inquiry in Washington that she felt threatened by the president. Marie Yovanovitch said shady interest the world over had learned it, uh, how little it took to remove an American ambassador who did not give them what they wanted. Mozambique's top court has dismissed the opposition party Renamo's application to have the results of the general election cancelled. A written judgment said there wasn't sufficient evidence of electoral fraud. Incumbent President Philippe Nyusi and his party Frelimo won the 15th of October election. Renamo leader Osufo Momade warned the annulment could result in violence. Police in Hong Kong have described the death of a 70-year-old man hit by a hard object during clashes between government supporters and pro-democracy protesters on Wednesday as murder. Meanwhile, China has strongly condemned Britain for what it called an appalling attack on Hong Kong's Justice Secretary during a visit to London on Thursday. Now, violence between students in Ethiopia has been steadily escalating over the past week following an incident at a university in the north of the country. Now, the army and police have been brought in to help deal with the unrest. The BBC's Kalkidan Yibelta reports. It all started on Saturday at Weldia University in northern Ethiopia after students watching an English Premier League match between Leicester City and Arsenal became violent with one another. Authorities say fights quickly escalated into ethnic clashes. Two students were killed and multiple others sustained injuries. In the following days, the violence spread to at least five universities across the country. One student was stabbed to death in the Bidolo University in the western part of the country, while a fourth student was killed outside his university campus in Debrabran in central Ethiopia. Members of the army and the federal police have been deployed to some universities to contain the unrest. Students in many universities have stopped attending classes because of fears over safety. Authorities have said that arrests have been made for inciting and being involved in the violence, but the number of arrests has not been made public. Ethiopia has seen a surge of inter-ethnic violence since Prime Minister Rabi Ahmed came to power with more than a million people displaced in 2018 due to ethnic violence. Political leaders have called for calm and the government says that it's working to bring peace back to campuses so that classes can be resumed. Kalkida Nibeltal, BBC News, Addis Ababa. Well, uh, that, that, of course, is Kalkidan Yebeltal in Addis Ababa. We want to take you back to our top story, that uh, strike by South Africa Airways staff uh, who've made good their threat and gone on strike. And uh, we can now bring in uh, Edward Francis Babu. He's an av aviation analyst and former pilot. He joins us uh, from Kampala. Thanks for taking time to talk to us on the program. What kind of restructuring do you think is needed for South African airlines uh, to turn around? Well, like, like already, some of them have told you that there's been a little, a little bit of mismanagement. And mismanagement starts all the way from the leadership, a political leadership that appoints the management. And therefore, the management must be done. 
Uh, now, restructuring the airline would also mean, uh, of course, laying off some staff because uh, during the mismanagement, they sort of filled it up. And by doing so, it means that the airline has, the, the people must realize that the airline to be able to function, they need a certain amount of people in there. They cannot just uh, fill it up with people and not be able to pay them. So restructuring is quite important, the government interference, all the corruption should all be dealt with. But why do you think airlines struggle all over the world to make profit? Well, well first and foremost, it's one of the most biggest, uh, toughest business. Uh, it's a cutthroat business. You need to really work very hard. And, so, and those airlines that actually succeed, they've got a certain type of discipline and culture. Uh, it is a... Airlines like Ethiopian Airlines, airlines like Singapore Airlines, uh, people like El Al in Israel, uh, it is because people are really interested in running those airlines. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, hard work and uh, people must not have uh, vices like corruption, things like that. Do government takeovers really uh, turn around loss-making airlines? Can they turn around loss-making airlines? Oh, yes. Well, for example, take, take, uh, take uh, El Al. Take Singapore Airlines, uh, take Ethiopian Airlines for that matter. But what is important is that the leadership must be sincere and they must get the right team to run the airline. And at the same time, these people must be up to speed. We are, we are, we are in the 21st century. The competition is extremely high, especially from the mega airlines. And therefore, you need people who are really on, 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 on the ball, if you like the expression. <laughs> The, the competition is very high. You've mentioned something very, very important there. Do you think we'll ever see airlines on the continent not working independently and also not working against each other? Uh, no, no, you don't have to work against each other. You just have to understand the market. For example, you take airlines which are supported by the government, uh, which is good, and especially in these poor economies. They start off the airline, they support it, but they must give it room and space to run and must have a team that can run an airline. And the best example in Africa is Ethiopian Airlines, which has been run from 1960, which it, it, it has had its ups and downs, but it has got that discipline and it's got the people who can run the airline uh, you know, effectively. Mm. Edward Francis Babu, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts on this subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. It's still to come in sports. We get all the latest results from qualifying for the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations. Tanzania playing at home have just equalized against Equatorial Guinea. I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Now, it appears Somalia and Kenya are again normalizing diplomatic ties despite an ongoing maritime boundary case at the International Court of Justice. Now, this follows a meeting on Thursday between Kenya's President Uhuru Kenyatta and his counterpart, Mohamed Abdullahi Farmaju. Now, the first step, they say, is restoring the issuance of travel visas on arrival for Somali government officials and the resumption of direct flights between Mogadishu and Nairobi. Well, let's say speak to Somalia's Foreign Affairs Minister Ahmed Isid Awad. He joins us from Nairobi. Thank you for taking time to talk to us and focus on Africa. One of the reasons why there's been tension between Somalia and Kenya is because of Somalia's decision to take this, this border case to the ICJ. Are you withdrawing the case from the ICJ? No, the case is uh, already in the court and that's where it will remain until uh, the court decides on the case. All right, so yesterday, the president, Abdullahi, said the case before the, the, the court um, will be resolved, and these were his words, in a mutually acceptable manner. What does that mean, mutually acceptable manner? Well, uh, uh, the president, first of all, didn't use those words, but uh, if you will, uh, the president made it clear, both presidents made it clear that the relationship between Somalia and Kenya, Somali people and the Kenyan people, are much deeper and bigger and wider than, uh, than the, uh, the border, maritime border dispute. And the uh, shared interests are uh, much uh, vaster. 
So uh, the case is just uh, one uh, one event, and uh, and that should be uh, that should be decided by the court. But uh, the president is referring to uh, uh, the willingness of the Somali people, the Somali government, led by the president, to uh, have a, a good relationship, a, a very close. Uh, brotherly relationship with with Kenya. What's really going on here? Because this is the, t the third time that we've seen this happening, this so-called normalization of ties. We saw the Ethiopian prime minister intervene in March, Egyptian uh, president just the other day, and then now. How do we know that this is just not lip service that uh, the two heads of state are paying us? It's not a lip service. I just counted to you the uh, the the solid uh, uh, foundation for the relationship between Somalia and Kenya as Kenyan president Uhuru said we are uh, uh, joined by by fate we it's not uh, our choice to 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 be neighbors so we want to make uh, uh, advantage of that and uh, uh, if there are uh, some uh, disputes from time to time, uh, which happens in every situation, then we should overcome. And that's what the two uh, leaders mm. uh, decided to do. Do you have any concerns about the kind of attention that Kenya pays to the self-declared Somaliland, briefly? No, Kenya respects the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the of Somalia. All right, know uh, that for sure. All right, Ahmed Isi Awad, thank you for taking time to talk to us on Focus on Africa. Thank you. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's time now for some sport, Peter. Many thanks, Sophie. Now, more qualifying matches today for the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations. Two games are already underway. Equatorial Guinea took the lead against Tanzania, but the Taifa Stars equalized about 10 minutes ago. The game between Zimbabwe and Botswana is still nil-nil. Today's late game kickoff in just over an hour with Tunisia hosting Libya and Mauritania traveling to Morocco. Mauritania are looking to qualify for the Cup of Nations for the second successive tournament. They acquitted themselves well in Egypt earlier this year with two nil-nil draws against Angola and Tunisia after a 4-1 defeat to Mali. Their coach, Coretan Martin, says they won't be taking Morocco for granted. For us, it's going to be a difficult match, especially when you look at the Morocco players, players who've already got European experience. But we've also come to show our football and to make the best match possible and, of course, try to win points here. Well, Morocco, on their part, will be hoping to put a disappointing 2019 Africa Cup of Nations behind them. The Atlas Lions were eliminated by, on penalties by Benin in the last 16 of this year's uh, competition in Egypt. Since then, they've played two international friendlies, a one-all draw with Burkina Faso and a narrow 1-0 win over Niger. And defender Romain Rice says they need to improve. We have to improve in, in all positions. Uh, attacking uh, midfield and defending. Uh, you know, uh, we need to score more goals and, and play like a team and uh, you know fight for each other. And uh, you know if these things, uh, uh, what will happen? Um, then you know the the victories and the and the, and the goals and everything will will come by themselves. And the qualifiers continue on Saturday and Sunday. On Saturday, there are two games. 2015 winners Ivory Coast are at home to Niger, while Madagascar take on Ethiopia. The Malagasy were the shock of this year's tournament, making it all the way to the quarterfinals. But Saturday's game will be the last for team captain Faneva Andretsima. And he says it's time to give younger players a chance. There's a beginning, there's a end. So for me... Well, you know, there is a beginning and an end. Um, for me, it's today. I decided to stop. Well, I'm not young either, you know. I'm 35 years old and it's time to hand it over to the young players. That's why I'm stopping here. And like this, there's some sort of uh, end over, you know. And, well, I started here in Madagascar, so I wanted to finish here. 
Well, Sunday is the beginning of match day two in these qualifiers. The games on that day include Guinea v Namibia. Chad are at home to um, Mali and South Africa are also at home to Sudan. You can find out more details of the games on our website, bbc.com forward slash African football. Now to Thursday's qualifiers. Kenya held Mohamed Salahless Egypt one all and defending champions Algeria buried Zambia under a five gold avalanche as they began their title defense. Debutant Mohamed Kudus clinched victory for Ghana over South Africa while Mali and Guinea ended two all after four goals in 19 minutes. The biggest upset of the day Comoros beat Togo one nil in Lome and a Patrick uh, a Pierre Emerick Aubameyang inspired Gabon held the Democratic Republic of Congo in Kinshasa, while Zimb uh, Mozambique were too strong for Rwanda winning by two goals to nil. And do spare a thought for Bafana Bafana. Though having lost to Ghana, they now have to make alternative plans to get back home due to the strike by South Africa Airways that we told you earlier about today. Sophie, that's just what. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Now, you're looking... If it can come on now, you're looking at the club colors of the Italian football giants, that's AS Roma. Nearly 6,000 miles separate Kenya and Italy. And yet, this football team based in Rome helped find two missing children in Nairobi. Confused? BBC Sport Africa's Peter Musembi has all the details. In August, and here in Nairobi, two young Kenyan children went missing, leading to understandable anguish among their families. I was looking for him everywhere. Every time I came home and saw his clothes laid out as usual, mostly his school uniform, I would break down. Tears wouldn't stop rolling. But help was at hand, albeit through the unlikely route of a world-famous Italian football club. When both Henrik Mkhitaryan and Chris Smalling signed for the club in August, AS Roma announced their signings while also putting out information about missing children. AS Roma, which launched the campaign in June, has over 16 million followers on social media, and their help is proving priceless. So far, they have found five missing children in Belgium, United Kingdom, and the two in Kenya. I was at work when I was called with news that they had found my child. I was joyous. I was crying. Everyone asked me what happened. It was like a miracle had happened. As soon as I, I found out that the child that was on, on my announcement thing got found, I think, was, was a great feeling. I remember I was with my family and I showed my mum and, and she, she's not really social media savvy, but she, she really respected the, the club for, for what they're doing and she's never seen anything like that with any other clubs and, and nor have high until, until I arrived. I think people are tired now of the excesses of football, the amount of money that circulates in football, the politics of football. So where you can have a, a football club trying to do something that's about more than just them and giving back, I think that's why it resonated the campaign that we did. Now we have a Swahili account. When we advertise, you know, Kenyan children who are missing or Tanzanian children who are missing, um, we have a much better chance of finding them. It's the same for Pigeon. You know, we want to team up with a Nigerian charity. We can use social media for, for more than just promoting ourselves. Ain't that great? Now, before we go, a quick look at a top story today on Focus in Africa. South Africa's troubled national airline has grounded all its planes as staff go on strike. The debt-laden airline hasn't turned a profit since 2011 and wants to cut a fifth of the workforce over 900 jobs. And that's Focus in Africa for now. Thanks for your company.